What's up, guys? How are you doing? Good, good, good. Uh, if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is TJ, and I get to be the youth pastor here. Uh, real quick, before we start, I just wanted to show a picture of my siblings. Um, they are, they mean a lot to me. So in the middle, that's my sister, Kaylin. Um, she's not just randomly wearing a wedding dress. It was her wedding recently. And then on the right is my brother, Kyle, who just recently graduated college, which shocked everyone. And so... Um, but I always don't, I don't like to show this picture uh, because everyone's always like, wow, your family is so beautiful. Like your sister is beautiful. Your brother is so handsome. And I'm like waiting for mine. And it just never comes. And I'm like, cool. Well, that hurt my ego a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, I've been on staff now for, for two months and it's been absolutely incredible. And uh, a few weeks ago, we celebrated Grace Place's 25 year as a church, like that is absolutely, that's, that's not normal, that's so cool. And uh, it reminded me of this story. Uh, so 52 years ago, uh, we went to the moon for the very first time and uh, Neil Armstrong uh, actually stepped down on the moon and everyone knows the famous, famous line, this is one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. And I, I understand that this is a very controversial topic now because there's a lot of people that don't believe the moon landing existed. And also uh, the prices and just the sale of edibles have also gone up. And so I don't know if those two things relate to each other, um, but I think they might have something to do with each other. But everyone knows that quote, but what a lot of people don't know is inside his spacesuit, he actually had a piece of the airplane wing from the Wright Brothers flyer. Because 66 years prior, before the moon landing, Wilbur and Orville Wright in 1903 flew for the first time in human history. They flew 120 feet. So in 66 short years, we went from a 120 foot flight to a quarter of a million mile mission to the moon. And what Neil Armstrong was saying by having that piece in his uh, spacesuit was, hey, I'm honoring those that laid the foundation for us to get where we are. And so I've been on staff here for two months. And so I just wanted to take a moment to honor those who have been here a year, maybe five years or maybe 25 years for laying the foundation of what it looks like to be a church all about Jesus. And come on, yeah, I, I can say anything. I love you, you're awesome. I really do. Uh, but if you're new here or if you've been here two months just like me, it's not like, hey, they set that foundation and we just try to keep up with them. It's, hey, no, we get to link arms and run this race together. Because if, if there's one thing I know about being here is our church lives out Matthew 28, 18 through 20 so well. It's Jesus talking to his disciples. And it said, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of age. That's what we get to be a part of because our church lives this out so well. But like I said, I've been on staff for two months and it was actually about a month ago, Clay came up to me and he was like, yo, TJ. He didn't say, yo, TJ, Clay doesn't talk like that. But he said, hey, TJ, I would really like for you to, to uh, speak in our relationship series on a Sunday morning. And in my head, I said, Clay, I'm a youth pastor for a reason. Adults kind of scare me just a little bit. I, I, that's why I'm a youth pastor. But the weirdest thing happened. My mouth said, yeah, man, I think that's going to be a great idea. And so I don't know the mix up between these two things. But then he goes, hey, I think it would be really cool to talk about singleness from a singles perspective. Because I think our church and just the church in general needs to hear about it. Here's the thing. In my head, I said, Clay, you have lost your dang mind. There is no chance I'm going to talk about it. Weirdest thing. My mouth said, I think that would be a great idea. And so th this message is not, I'm not labeling it a singleness message. This message is really how to be content in every, any season that you are in. But I think uh, a great philosopher had a great quote about singleness. And I was going to quote it, but I think showing the clip would be a little bit. What is it like being single? I like it. I like starting each day with a sense of possibility. And I'm optimistic because every day I get a little more desperate and desperate situations yield the quickest results. Come on, that's good. That's Michael Scott. I was gonna see how many office quotes I can fit in, but they said only one, and so I was like, okay, fine. Um, but actually, uh, before I get into to the message, uh, I wanted to share a story, and uh, 
is my most embarrassing story. And so I have a few rules. One, the second we leave this auditorium, you forget the story ever existed. Cool? No, I'm being serious. If you come up to me and you're like, hey, TJ, that story was so, I will walk the other direction and I might throw coffee on you. Um, but the reason I tell this story is because when they flew me out uh, a few months ago to speak to the youth, uh, I told this story because I think you can learn a lot about someone from an embarrassing story. And uh, so if we ever get coffee or anything, I will probably ask you, hey, tell me your most embarrassing story. Um, so I'm going to tell you mine. And just please bear with me here. It's, it's bad. And I've had to tell it twice. And so the third one I'm not looking forward to. Uh, so I, I grew up in Orlando. And uh, it would only be fitting, since I grew up in Orlando, that my celebrity crush would be someone from the Disney Channel or Radio Disney. And so her name was Megan Nicole. She was on Radio Disney. And I was in love. Like, you may think, TJ, we all have celebrity crushes. Not like this one, okay? Like, this was pretty serious. And there was a moment where she was coming to play a concert in Orlando, and all my friends were like, TJ, you gotta go. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't really wanna go because I'll see her, I'll be more heartbroken because we can't date, and then I'll just go home sad. And they're like, TJ, this is your one opportunity for you to date her. And I was like, have you ever been to a concert? You don't talk to the person performing. And they're like, no, 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 TJ, just listen. Once she sees you, she will want to date you. You have brown hair. You have brown eyes. I'm like, those are just facts about me. Those aren't compliments. But they're like, TJ, trust us. So I was like, okay. But I was like, how do I get her attention? And they said one word, poster. Not like the little posters. Like, you know those science fair project posters, like the trifold posters you would do it on? And, and so I, I wrote, she had a song called Beautiful. So I wrote her lyrics on that poster. And at the bottom, I wrote, can I take you on a date? I know what you're thinking, TJ, how'd you get so smooth? Thank you, I know. <laughs> and so we get there, and all my, the whole time my friends are hyping me up. They're like, you got this, this is you, no shot. She says no. And uh, so we get there, and uh, we, we're late, because I was getting ready, obviously. And so we're in the very back, and to give you context, it's uh, four juniors in high school, boys, at, that's me and my friends. And then the average age of this concert was 10 or 11. So we stood out, but it's fine, okay? And, and so there's a moment in the concert, uh, and I was like, I'm never gonna be, she's not gonna see this, but there's a moment where she was talking to the crowd, and all my friends were like, now. And so I lift up this poster as high as I can, and the next thing you know, I hear this. I'm so sorry, I can't read that. Do you mind coming to the front? And I've never seen, G or I've never seen God part the Red Sea, but I saw 10-year-olds just completely part for me. Like, it, it was so, I know, we love those Christian Bible jokes. I just had to throw that. No, but it, it really felt like that. And so I was walking down, and uh, I get there, and I show her the sign, and she goes, oh, my gosh, that is so cute. Do you mind if I keep it? And you know when you're so starstruck, words are, like, tough, you know? And so I was like, here. And she goes, what's your name? And I think I said TJ. I'm not too sure, honestly. And, and so I just completely, I walk back. And uh, all my friends were like, did you ask her? And I was like, where was I? Because I have no idea what just happened. And they're like, you blew it. And I was so heartbroken. I blew the one shot I had. And my friends were like, she would have said yes. But then a few moments go by. I get a tap on the shoulder. And I don't remember his name, but he goes, hey, I'm with Radio Disney. And Megan would really like a picture with you after the concert. I was like, Megan wants a pitch? I guess I, I guess I have time for a picture. Like, and so me and my friends would go to this suite where we don't belong. Like, these are like super important people. And then you have four junior boys in high school that are like, food, this is great. And uh, I thought they just wanted like a selfie. But they set up like a backdrop and there's like cameras. And I was like, oh, this is a big deal. And so then I see Megan and we take the picture. But before I show you this picture, if I see any phone, I will come at you. <laughs> and two, I hit my growth spurt at this time, and so I was 6'2", and she's 4'10", so it looks like I'm with a child, but I promise she was a year older than me. <laughs> and so you can show, oh gosh, I have to look at this again. You can show the picture now. Oh, please don't, if it doesn't work, that's fine too. <laughs> like, I promise you there's a picture, and they've showed it like twice. That's almost the picture. That's what I say when I see it, actually. I get so frustrated. But whenever they get the picture, they'll, they'll th oh gosh. Oh, that hurts. That hurts my soul to look at. Why are you guys zooming in on the picture? Like, that's not necessary. <laughs> like, take it off. 
I'm also wearing four shades of the same color, and I thought it looked great. But yeah, that, okay, guys, seriously, please take that off. That, <laughs> that's the last time I have to look at that picture. But so we take this picture, and uh, all my friends were like, you have to ask her. And so I was like, hey, I would really like to take you on a date. And uh, she goes, hey, me and my family are actually going to Benihana's after this. Do you want to come with? And I was like, no kidding. I was like, she wants me to meet her family already. Like, this is moving so quick. <laughs> like, I mean, sure, I guess. And so we go to Benihana's. We have a great time. And uh, her family, we end the dinner. I offered to pay. And I was like, I got it. But the dad paid, and I'm so glad because my card would have got declined. I just wanted to have that offer out there. Um, and, and so finally, uh, it's just me and Megan. We're walking around this hotel. And uh, I was like, hey, I would really like to take you on a date, not with your parents. And she goes, I'm so sorry. Uh, with me being in California, I just don't think this would ever work. And for two months, people thought my dog died. I was so heartbroken. And, and when I look back at the story, I always ask myself, why was I so heartbroken? I knew her for three hours, but for two months, I was so depressed. <laughs> but it was because I, I honestly believe that what my friends were saying were true. That everything they said, like it was going to happen. And so when it didn't pan out, I was like, what the heck? And I think a lot of times in the topic of relationships, we tend to view what culture says about relationships instead of what the word of God actually says, especially in the topic of singleness. And so I wanna take a, a little th script from Jesus on his Sermon on the Mount where he basically said, hey, he told, you've heard it said this, this is what culture says, but this is what I say. And so we're gonna look at a few things that culture says about relationships and singleness, but then I'm gonna say what the word of God actually says. Sound good? Yeah. Great, all right, first point. Culture says singleness is a disease and a relationship is a cure. But the word of God says singleness is a gift. First Corinthians 7, 7 says this, I say this as a concession, not as a command, but I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. I think a lot of times when our culture looks at people who are single, we kind of view them as less mature, you know? Like, hey, hey, you're on the JV team, but the second you get married, you made it to varsity. And that makes everyone in us especially feel like we're less than them. But the Bible that I read says, I am complete in Christ and that I lack nothing. And uh, when we think of gifts, um, here's the thing. I don't know if you're like me, but the second I think of gifts, I think of Christmas. Um, and we're three months away, so I'm super excited. But there are three types of gifts that I got in my family. The first gift, not this small one, this big one. You see this gift under your tree? So excited. You're like, all your faith is in your parents that they, they got you the Xbox or they got you the thing that you wanted and you open it up and usually you're so excited. You're like, this is the one I've been waiting for. So there's this gift. But then you got this gift. Uh, it's a little bit smaller. Probably my sister got it for me. It's probably clothes or socks. And you're like, cool, it's fun to open. I hope it's something good. But it, honestly, it's mainly clothes. And so you got this gift. And then you got the last gift. This is the wild card. You got this, you got the card. Here's the thing, this card could be filled with money, it could be filled with words of affirmation. Here's the thing, I'm a words of affirmation kind of guy, but on Christmas morning, that's not working for me, okay? <laughs> so there's this. My Aunt Julie, and I had three types of people in my family that would get me these. My Aunt Julie, my sweet Aunt Julie, I would open the card and like, you know when money is just falling out, but you pretend like you're still reading the card? You're like, oh, and I love you too. And you're counting like the money that falls out. You have this card. Then you got my Uncle Robert. Uncle Robert. I would open the card for 26 years. It would always write, I got you next year. <laughs> next year has never come, Uncle Robert. And so I don't know what you're doing, but I'm, I'm praying for that year. And then you have my sweet Nana. And ever since I was little, my Nana would get me stocks. And as a kid, you're like, what do I, what do I do with this? Like, it's, what is a stock? And she was like, hey, it's, it's like money, but you can't spend it. And maybe in a very long time, it'll be worth a little bit more money. And you're like, thanks, grandma, I guess. And then you go back to Aunt Julie's card and look how much money you actually got. But the reality is, 
when there's a tough financial decision you have to make later on in your life, it's not the Xbox, it's not the clothes, the gift you are most thankful for is the stock. Because it takes a person with enough love and wisdom to give you a gift in a season that you didn't think you needed. And I think when Paul is saying that singleness is a gift and, and whatever season you are in right now, he's saying is a gift. I think a lot of times we get so frustrated because we may be in a season that we don't want. We may be in a season where we're like, God, just get me through this season. I don't want to be here. This is nothing but a gift. But the reason you're in that season is because he's trying to develop something in you. And I think when we look at the story of Joseph in the Bible, it, it, pits, it paints this picture so clearly. Joseph, just a summary, he was the youngest of 12 brothers. His, uh, he had a dream by God that he was going to rule, so he told his brothers. They throw him in a pit, then they sell him to slavery, and while he's in slavery, Potiphar, the, his master's wife, comes on to him. Joseph flees, but Potiphar's wife says, hey, that guy came on to me. And so now Joseph is in prison. I can guarantee when Joseph was walking through that, he was like, God, what it, I'm just doing what you're saying. And, and I'm not where... You, I, I'm not where I thought I would be, but he used all those scenarios to build something in Joseph to get him to the palace where God intended him to be. He just wanted to develop some things inside of him. And I think a lot of times we try to just get through the season we're in, but, but th there's a verse in Psalm 23, 4. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say even though I sit, even though I stand. It says even though I walk. Whatever season you're in, you're not supposed to just be complacent and just hope for the next season. Maybe you have kids and you're like, my kids are driving me crazy. I know that from a fact because that's my, that was my parents. I, I was not a great kid. But maybe you're in a season where your kids are driving you crazy and you're just like, I just can't wait till they be, they're older. I just can't wait till they're older so I can get out of this season. But my favorite part about the story of Joseph is when he was in the pit, when he was in prison, when he was in slavery, the Bible says this, but the Lord was with him. Every single time he was in the pit, it said, but the Lord was with him. All right, he gets sold into slavery, but guess what? The Lord was with him. All right, now he's in prison, but guess what? The Lord was with him. You can walk through whatever season you are in. Why? Because the Lord is with you. In 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 34, it says this, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Maybe you're in the season of singleness right now because God is trying to ask you, am I enough? And I will be the first one to say when someone comes up to me and they were like, hey, maybe you're in the season because you just have to understand, is God enough? I hate that person. Because I'm like, of course God is enough for me. Like, I understand God is enough. Like, I understand that, but right now I'm really struggling. But it took me a little bit to, to realize maybe that's not true. Because if God took away everything, is he still enough for you? And that was probably the hardest realization I had to come to because I'm not standing here and saying I am great at that. I'm standing here and saying I'm leading through conviction because that's something I'm still working through. Is God enough for you? Singleness is not a disease. Your season you're in is not a disease. It's not meant to hurt you. It's a gift. But we have to take a step back and change our perspective. The second point is culture says it's okay to be alone, but God says it's not good for man to be alone. TJ, doesn't this contradict everything you just said in your first point? You said singleness is a gift, and now you're saying it's not good for me to be alone. I'm not talking about dating. I'm talking, to, I'm talking about godly relationships. It says this in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. You need a community that is going to push you towards Jesus. You need a community. You need people around you that are going to push you towards Jesus. And I think a lot of times we always say, I don't have time. I'm so busy, TJ. I can't commit to this. I can't commit to serve and be in community. I can't commit to a group and be in community because we're like, I don't have time. But, but it reminds me so much of roller coasters because here's the thing. I grew up in Orlando. 
And so roller coasters were a big deal because you had Universal and you had Disney. Disney's not all fun and games. There's some really scary roller coasters, okay? But I remember my first roller coaster. I was in Universal. We were on a fifth grade field trip. And uh, all my friends were like, TJ, let's ride the Hulk. And I'm like, that sounds scary, but okay. And they're like, have you ridden a roller coaster before? And I was like, yeah, yeah, all the time. When I was born, I got rode one. Like, I don't know. I'm just lying. I'm so terrified of roller coasters. They scare me. And, and so there's always this thing. I remember walking into the Hulk and, and being like, okay, you got this. You got this. Just sit down. And the second you sit down, they trick you because they trap you in this thing and you can't get out. They, they put this harness over you, and they're like, all right, good luck, and you're committed to this roller coaster. No matter what happens, you're committed. And I don't know if you know about Hulk. This is just a side note. It starts off really slow like this, and then all of a sudden they go, oh, my gosh, something's wrong, and it shoots you up. And I'm like, I thought the drop was the scary part. No, this part was the scary part. And, and you're stuck. You're, you're committed. And, and you need to be committed to godly relationships and community. You can't just be like, hey, I'm going to test this out and jump ship when I don't like what's happening. Because the reality is a lot of us are getting out of these relationships and serving because of what comes with it. One of my favorite people in the Bible is Peter. I think Peter gets a lot of bad rep because he was the one that sank and everyone's like, Peter, oh, he's, no, not a good disciple. But I like to look at when Jesus first called Peter. Jesus simply says, come and follow me. And the Bible says that Peter left his net at once and followed him. How do you know that Peter is committed? Because he sacrificed something. He said, hey, I am leaving my business to follow you. And most of us won't commit because we won't give up time and we won't give up these certain habits. You're going to have to sacrifice something if you want to be in godly relationships. I want to brag, uh, me being a youth pastor, I want to brag on our youth leaders real quick. Uh, we recently just started having youth every single Sunday night. So every single Sunday night at 6.30, we, we have worship, we have a live message, and then our students go into small groups that are led by these adult leaders. They give up their Sunday nights every single week now. Why? Because they understand the importance of community. They understand that these students need to be in small groups and need this community. They understand that, hey, it's not just I'm building community for them, that they're building community with the other leaders around them. That's the importance of community. You don't want a community where you're struggling in your marriage right now and you're like, ah, it's, it's different. I just kind of want to jump ship. And your friends are like, yeah, leave him. He's not worth it. No, you need friends that are going to call you out and give you marriage counseling and help you through this. You don't need friends when you're single and you're going on a bunch of dates and all your friends are like, yeah, do you, all right? Go, go as much as, go on many dates as you can. And no, you need friends that are going to be like, hey, there's a deeper issue that I think you're not addressing. Those are the types of people you need in your life because the reality is when we hang out with people that are, are, are living in this world, it's so easy for us. We want to be like, hey, I'll drag them up to where I'm at. I'm going to drag them up and they're going to start coming to church with me. And it's going to be great. But so often than not, they drag us down because it's a lot easier for them to pull me down than it is for, them, for me to pull them up. You need to look at the people in your life who you're doing life with on a regular basis and ask, are they bringing me closer to Jesus? Or are they bringing me away? Because I'm, I'm a full advocate of reaching the lost. 100% agree with it. That's why we are called to this earth. But when they are in our close circle, oftentimes we want to be the cool Christians that are uh, in the world. But then more often than not, we slowly start to become of the world. And then being in the world was just an option for post-Christianity. Because I think what happens is uh, the people you are doing life with right now, maybe the reason or not, you're following Jesus a few years from now. And that's really scary to think about. I gave my life to Christ when I was 16 in high school, and it was actually a big deal because no one in my family liked or believed in Jesus. It was actually frowned upon. But my mom sent me to a Christian school because she thought it was like a military boot camp. And so she's like, yeah, we're going to send him here. And through that process, I ended up finding who Jesus was, and it changed my life. But what I didn't know was a few years after I got saved were going to be some of the most difficult times in my life. My parents leaving, my girlfriend of two years, we broke up, and you may be thinking, TJ, you're in high school, of course you're going to break up. I just want to say this as clarity, if you're in high school and you're dating, don't let other people discredit the relationship you have. 
because in high school when you're dating, like that's the world to them. And so when it's so easy for us now as adults to be like, oh, we're like, yeah, you'll find someone else, but don't let that discredit how hurt they are. But I remember the only thing that kept me going was because I was serving in my church and I had such godly people around me that when I wanted to jump ship, they wouldn't let me. It reminds me of a, a story that I saw in a documentary. And uh, you know when you're watching TV and like you fall asleep and then you wake up and you're like, what the heck did this just go to now? Um, that happened to me, it was on the Discovery Channel and it was uh, this documentary on fire ants. I know what you're thinking, wow, that sounds fun. Kind of was. Um, but what fire ants do when there's a storm it is the fire ants all cling together to form this weird like ball shape and they cling to each other. So when they're floating down the side or wherever they are, they're all together. And it says when one fire ant, it showed a video of when one fire ant slowly starts to break from the pack and they're drifting away, the fire ants would create this link, this chain link to go get that other fire ant. You need people who in your life when a storm is coming and you want to drift away that are going to pull you back to the truth of Jesus. Because I think it's so easy for us to, to be in, in different relationships that don't do that because we're like, oh, we grew up together, we're friends. But that's, Jesus wants so much more for your relationships. And I'm not saying this because I'm a pastor here. I, I really hope you hear my heart. But one of the best places to find community is when you serve. And, and I hope you hear my heart when I say this. We don't need you to serve. We want you to serve because we know what God's going to do through you. We don't, we don't need you to, to help lead the youth. I want you to lead the youth because I know how important it is to have an older figure pointing you back to Jesus every single time. And I know that may be crazy to some, but we don't need you to serve, but we know what God wants for you. Because the reality is the easy thing to do for a church is just to have Sunday mornings, right? Just have Sunday mornings and we don't need groups. We don't need youth. Just do Sunday mornings and we're good. But the reason why we do all these things is because we know the importance of community. Stubbornly commit to Christian community. And my last point is, that, is this. Culture says you are the sum of your past mistakes, but Jesus says you are made brand new in him. I think this point is so crucial when it comes to relationships because I think Rich Wilkerson Jr. says it best. He says this, if you never heal on what hurt you, you will bleed on people who never even cut you. Guilt is feeling bad for what you've done, but shame is feeling bad for who you are. And, and what I wanna say is that God died for both your guilt and for your shame. When we understand that our past mistakes do not define who we are as a person, we are able to live in such a freedom. If you're single, the reason you're single is not because you messed up one relationship. It's not because you're screwed up one relationship and now you are destined to be alone because here's the thing, failure is an event. But what the enemy is going to try to do is tell you that failure is you. And that is a complete lie. Failure is an event that happened in your life. It's not who you are as a person. And one way I'm so reminded by that is this exercise. And this exercise may be really hard for some of you to do, but I think there's freedom on the other side of it. So if everyone can close your eyes right now, I want you to think back to a moment where you messed up the most. I want you to think about this moment where, man, if people just found out what you did, they would look at you differently, they would treat you differently, and they would talk to you differently. A moment you probably push so far back in your brain because the second you think about it, it hurts. A moment where you want no one to know about. And now I want you to look up here. And I wanna be one of the first ones to tell you that in that moment, Jesus still died for you. In that moment, God still looked at you and said, that's my child. There is nothing you could do that will separate you from the love of God. God still looked at you and said, hey, I want that person. I wanna read a few truths and remind you of what God calls you. 
You are a child of God, according to John 1 and 12. You are a friend of Jesus, according to John 15, 15. You are justified and redeemed, according to Romans 3, 24. You have been accepted by Christ in Romans 15, 7. You are a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And you are no longer a slave. You are a child of God in Galatians 4, 7. Do not let the world tell you who you are, because the Bible I read says I am no longer a slave and that I'm a child of God. Nothing you can do will separate you from God. I think a lot of times in our culture, they're gonna say, hey, you messed up, that's who you are. That's not who you are. Because the Bible I read says completely different things. If everyone can close your eyes and uh, bow your heads. Uh, I told myself I would never stand, uh, stand on the stage and not give people an opportunity to respond on what God's doing in their heart. And so as we talk about the series of relationships, maybe you have realized the most important relationship that you don't have in your life is a relationship with your creator. Because God loved you so much, but there's a problem and that problem was sin. And what sin does, sin separates us from the love of God. But, but like I said, God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus, not a prophet. He didn't send an angel. He sent his son Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice. Jesus walked this earth and he did nothing but heal. He did nothing but perform miracles. And they hung him on a cross, a death that you deserved, a death that I deserved and he died. Well, the gospel is called good news for a reason because three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, defeating death, hell, and sin. And the Bible makes it so clear that if you believe in your hearts and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And there are some of you in here tonight that are like, hey, I've never fully given my life to Christ and I'm not going to wait anymore because God is doing something in my heart that I am ready to fully commit to him. And so I wanna give you an opportunity to respond. I'm gonna to count to three and I just want you to simply uh, raise your hand and meet me eye to eye. Because I believe when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was thinking about this moment right here. Don't let this opportunity decide. If God is doing something in your heart, now's your opportunity to, to respond and say, Jesus, I am tired of living for what culture says. I am ready to give you my entire life. And so when I count to three, I just want you to simply raise your hand and meet me eye to eye. One, I don't, I don't want you to miss this moment. This will be the best decision you will ever make in your life. Two, three, just slip your hand up right now and meet me eye to eye. I see your, I see your two hands. I see, I see you guys. I am so proud of you. I see your hand right there. I am so incredibly proud of you. I see you guys back there. That is the best decision you will ever make in your entire life. I see your hands over there to the left. I am so proud of you. That's the best decision that you will ever make in your entire life. A few more moments. If God is doing something in your heart and you're saying, hey, I'm ready to give him everything, just slip your hand up and meet me eye to eye. I see your hand right there, man. I'm so proud of you. That is the best decision you will make. Here's the thing, uh, we, we don't just say we're a family because it's some cute corny thing we say, we say it because it's true. This church is a family. And so one thing I know is no family prays alone. And so if you guys could all just repeat this prayer after me, just say this, dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. I give you my life. Use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we celebrate for those that just made that decision? Uh, if you just made that decision, I, I, again, I wanted to be the first one to say that that is the best decision you will ever make in your entire life. That will change your trajectory from going forward. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I'm saying that you're gonna have a hope in Jesus and your eternity is different. And so your next step is baptisms. Baptism is simply an outward expression of an inward faith. And, and here at the church, we're actually having baptisms in, in a few months. And so it's going to be a party and we're going to celebrate. That's your next step. Guys, I want everyone to take a big breath in right now. Big breath out. Okay, that wasn't for you, that was for me because I got through this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 
Ah, thank you.